Hello and welcome to the DIY Investing YouTube channel. We are working through every company in the S&P 500 and today is Cincinnati Financial Corporation, ticker CINF. Over the next few minutes, I'll discuss my thoughts on both the valuation of this company and its business quality. First up, this company is in the insurance industry. They have an $18 billion market cap and an $18 billion enterprise value. This means they're not really having to use any excess leverage in order to get the returns of their business. So Cincinnati Financial operates together in the property casualty insurance product line. They have five segments, commercial, personal, excess and surplus, life insurance and investments. Um, so commercial, so casualty, property, auto, works comp, auto insurance, homeowners, dwelling, existence, life, um, liability. So basically very broad range of products in this company. They have a beta 0.68, which is quite low for an S&P 500 company, tends to suggest that the business is a relatively low volatility as well, um, but not always. And again, you can see some immediate volatility when we get down to this return on equity number. So I see two things when I see this return on equity. I see 20 straight years of profitability, which is a very positive sign for the overall returns that I can expect because it's more towards a high quality company when every year I have profits and there are no losses. 20 straight years of profits is a very, very, very strong sign. Now, unfortunately, I do see cyclicality in this business. Now, every insurance company is going to have some ups and downs. Um, but some of this is seems like industrial, you know, cyclicality. You kind of go up to 14%, down 8 8%, down to 3%, back on up to 8%, and kind of circles around. Now, if this 2011 number had been 8%, then it doesn't look as cyclical because you have a pretty stable number in here, 7 8% return on equity number. But then you get whipsawed in um, basically from 2017. So like from 2016, you go 8%, 13%, 3 22, 11, 24. This is very, very unpredictable. It looks cyclical, but that's kind of hard to say. It's a cycle and it's a very, very short cycle. Um, so I don't really know what's going on here. Um, obviously COVID took place in 2020, but it doesn't explain 2018 and 2019. Um, something really weird is going on and makes this very hard to predict. That predictability is important because predictability is one of the key aspects of a high quality business. Um, so this is a negative for me. So unless there's some sort of explanation for what's going on here, I'm a little less interested based upon that. Now return on equity, 10 year median return of 9.4%. This number is just too low. I I need it to be double digits. It needs to be 10% plus. You can see the 10% line here, and we can just look at how many years they are above the 10% line um, over the last 20 years. And we get one, two, three, four, five, six. So only six years out of 20 do they have a return on equity above 10%, which is too little for me to be interested in the business. But there are times when you're you're willing to invest in that. If the price to book level is low enough, the valuation is low enough, you can justify something like that. Now, importantly, the PE is below 10. Now that's very important for making something like this work. If you're going to have a business um, that's not returning a strong enough return on equity, you need to be paying a relatively low price. PE of nine is a low price. So that's good, that's positive. Um, so again, we're, I like the valuation. I'm not liking the business quality numbers right here. Now, 10-year CAGR gets interesting because you have revenue growth of 9.7% while they're paying a dividend. So you are paying a dividend here. Um, that revenue is growing faster than premiums, faster than assets, and you're getting some clear operating leverage because you're growing EPS at 33%. So you've gone from $2.56 77 cents of earnings per share up to $18 in 2021. But again, this number is way out of nowhere. You have a $12 number in 2019, um, but all your normal numbers are in this three range, six range, maybe seven if we're being generous and say 2020 is the standard. Um, so I think this PE number is not really truthful. It's based upon your most recent results. But you know, if you say if the actual earnings is seven dollars, then maybe your PE is closer to fifteen, even sixteen, and then it gets a little bit less attractive because you, your price to book is paying above one, and yet your return on equity is below ten percent. It doesn't make sense to me to ever pay a P price to book above one when your return on equity is below ten. It's just a simple rule of thumb that makes it hard to justify the price here with this type of business quality. Now I'm gonna generally avoid businesses with this low turn on equity anyway. And it's tough because 
a lot of the stuff here would be relatively high quality. Look at this growth, strong growth, strong revenue growth over time. You're paying a dividend that's growing over time and you're getting this revenue growth. You should have good returns in this business. Um, it's just very, very unpredictable. If you're enjoying this video so far, please hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe. Your subscriptions help me to grow the channel and they let you know when I upload new videos each and every week covering new stocks. So if you like this video, if you want to see more of this, you need to be subscribed. You need to ring that bell so you get notified as I upload new videos. So let's go to the income statement. Now we can see they have relatively low fees. We just did a video on Cigna. You can check out the last video um, where they had a very strong fee income, but that's not true here. You have um, basically premium growth is driving their business. Premium plus investments. That's pretty normal for an insurance company. One thing you like to see is these policy benefits and claims is substantially below your premiums. So that's where you're getting this continuing growing income. Um, shares outstanding are basically flat. That's okay. Nothing good, nothing bad with that. Um, let's see what we can see from the balance sheet. Um, so again, long-term debt spreads flat at 800 million. I can appreciate that, not growing the leverage any. You're basically offsetting um, the cash and cash equivalents. Securities has grown substantially over time though, which is very good for potential income. I mean, look at this, you have 24 billion in securities here. Um, which is $6 billion more than your liabilities, but you began the decade at $11 billion securities, which is only $1 billion more than liabilities. So you're really starting to leverage up this security and investments portion of the portfolio. That's good for the business. You can see they're growing the shareholders' equity. This could be really good for the long-term results of this company. Cash flow statement. Let's see. You have some sl slow and steady stock-based compensation. And you have pretty steady share buybacks. But again, if we go to the income statement, you can see that the earnings per share is basically flat. So what I learned from this is that what they're doing is they're basically buying back shares to offset dilution. They're not trying to reduce shares outstanding. They're not trying to um, increase shares outstanding, but they're trying to offset dilution. You know, I received a question on Twitter. If you're not following me on Twitter, go to at Trey Hinnegan. You can follow me on Twitter. Um, and I had a question there and, and on YouTube kind of discussing, well, why is stock-based compensation um, understated a lot? And this is a good example. So you have, um, you know, from our income statement, you have basically stable, not growing earnings per share over time, or, or shares outstanding over time. And we can see stock-based compensation. And every year, the buybacks are higher than the stock-based compensation by a multiple of two to three sometimes four, and yet their share count is flat. Now, it does go down a little bit right here at the end when they get this boost up to 261, 144. But basically, you take this number by two or three, and that's gonna be what you're gonna have to pay to buy back that same amount of shares, and that's why I think these numbers are understated. As a general rule of thumb, it's nothing about this company in particular, but it's a good learning experience by looking here. Now, what I like to see is they've grown their dividend amount by 50 to 80% over the course of the decade, and that's in addition to the fact they're growing. You know, when you have a growth rate of 9% like this, that can provide all the return you need. Um, but if you don't have a dividend, then that literally is the only return you get is the growth. But if you have growth plus dividend, then you can get that extra growth. So you see this dividend growing at, you know, 5% a year. 6% a year across the decade. So you combine that with your revenue growth, then all of a sudden you're talking about, you know, 13, 14, 15% returns if they repeat what they did over the last decade. I don't know if that's likely. Um, you can see some of this is, is very peculiar what they're doing with earnings. Um, but, you know, it's attractive. I think this company has potential. Anytime you have 20 straight years of profits, um, it has a lot of potential. Insurance companies are very, very interesting. You know, you see if it's well managed, a company like Berkshire Hathaway can make you a lot of money if you hold over the long term. And so anytime you see this set up, you can be very attracted to it. Um, for me, Personally, the return on equity number doesn't hit my hurdle, so it's not going on my watch list. But for those with lower hurdle rates, this could actually be a very attractive company to consider. Thank you for listening to this episode. Please hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe. Your subscriptions will let you know when I upload new videos. As long as you ring that bell, you'll get notified when I put out new stock videos each and every week. Thank you for listening. And until next time, stop paying fees, start building wealth.